The passages of the Bible that we have read this morning kind of form bookends to the ministry of Jesus. The first one from Luke chapter 4 is often referred to as Jesus' inaugural sermon. Now, it does say he had preached in other synagogues, but it doesn't tell us anything about what he preached. And that's why this is referred to as Jesus' first or his inaugural sermon. The second passage comes from the end of Jesus' ministry, and uh, it indicates a passage that is spoken just prior to Jesus' ascension into heaven. Together, these verses teach us a lesson that everyone needs to hear. Older or younger, at home or on the job, in Salem or in Silverton, people need to hear this message. God is the God of the second chance. The God of grace in Jesus Christ offers to each person a second chance. We need this. We need to hear this truth because we all need a second chance. And I tell you, unless we understand how badly, how desperately we need the second chance that is offered to us in Jesus Christ, we will never have a reason to go to our neighbor or to our friend or to tell someone else in our family the good news of the love of Jesus Christ for sinners. In this first sermon, Jesus was handed the scroll of the Old Testament book of Isaiah. And he opened that scroll to a passage in Isaiah that is speaking about the year of Jubilee. Now, the year of Jubilee was familiar to all Israelites. God had told them to observe the year of Jubilee to remind them of the great rescue God had performed for them when he took them out of slavery in Egypt and gave them a new land of their own. God said, here's what I want you to do. Every 50 years, you will celebrate a special year, a year of Jubilee. All debts throughout the land will be canceled. All people who are slaves in any form, will be set free. You don't have to plant any crops. Farmers, I don't know if you're already busy at that, but no crops in the year of Jubilee. To remind you that God is the one who set you free, and God is the one who will provide for you each and every day. And that sign didn't only point back to the time when Israel was in Egypt, but it pointed ahead to the time when the Messiah would come to truly set God's people free from sin and the slavery of sin imposed upon every person when Adam and Eve fell into temptation because of the temptation put before them through the evil one, the devil. But as far as we know, Israel never celebrated the year of Jubilee. Nowhere in the scripture do you read that they actually did it. Why not? It just seems so impractical. I mean, cancel all debts. What do you think would happen to the stock market? Set prisoners free? What kind of a society would we have? And slaves? 
set them free too? Who would do the work that needs to be done? But Isaiah in this passage is really saying to God's people, if you give up on the year of Jubilee, you are also really giving up on your need for the Messiah. But the Messiah came. The anointed one of God, Jesus the Christ, came. He was born in Bethlehem, baptized by John, anointed by the Holy Spirit, tempted by the devil. And then one day, about 30 years later, he got up in his hometown of Nazareth, and he was given the scroll to read. And he read from this passage. A passage of Isaiah that predicted that when the Messiah came, there would be one more time, a final year of Jubilee. And after he read that passage, Jesus sat down. That was the custom in those days. You stood up to read the scripture. You sat down to preach. Sometimes I think that'd be easier to do. He sat down, and what did he say? Today, today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. In other words, to say he was saying, I am the Messiah. I am the God of the second chance. I am the one who has come to set the captives free. I am the one who has come to give good news to the poor and sight to those who are blind. I'm the one who cares for beggars, for those who are living in tents under bridges and other places, who don't amount to a hill of beans in society because society hasn't figured out a way to make a buck from them. But I came for them, Jesus says. You know what it means to have a second chance? I learned that about... 25 years ago, when we first went to the country of Cambodia, Cambodia had been oppressed for many, many years, first by the French, then under the government, the South, what we call South Vietnamese government of Long Nol, and then later under the communist regime of Pol Pot, who brutally, you can't even begin to describe. I have a little bone, about that small, that I picked up on the killing fields there, where babies were slaughtered by hitting them up against a tree to save bullets. Nobody cared. Nobody cared that that once lush countryside now had nothing because all the land was sown with landmines. You couldn't even get into the fields without getting killed. Nobody cared that the little girls there were forced into prostitution and forced to make pornographic films that made big dollars in the West, including this country. Nobody cared. Nobody cared. The Jubilee came to that country because the gospel of Jesus Christ came. And we were the privilege to be there very early on in that time when the gospel first started coming back to Cambodia. And people were overjoyed. People were willing to give up everything to hear God's word, to come and learn about Jesus Christ. And praise God, the gospel continues to be spread in that country today. They received a second chance. Today, this day, is a time of jubilee for us. Jesus the Master is calling us to be his disciples. What's that mean? What's it mean to be a disciple of Jesus? 
in Jesus' day, all young people, when they were early in life, already began to study the Old Testament. And especially all young boys. Think about this, you young fellows. When you were four or five years old, you began to memorize the Torah, the first five books of the Old Testament. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, all those names. All those names, you, you memorize them. And if you were really good, maybe one in 10,000, you would look to find a rabbi under whom you could continue your study. You would find a rabbi with authority, and that authority was called his way of teaching, his yoke. And you would come to that rabbi and you would say, Sir, may I please put your yoke on me? So I may learn from you. And it was an honor. An uncomparable honor to be accepted by such a rabbi to be taught by that person. What about all the other boys? They went back home. They went back home and learned to do whatever dad did. If dad was a blacksmith, if dad was a fisherman, if dad was a farmer, whatever dad did, you figured out how to do what dad did. But that disciple, that disciple learned from the rabbi by living with the rabbi day after day. You walk with the rabbi, and if the rabbi sat down, you sat down. If the rabbi stopped and picked up a stone, you stopped and picked up the phone, a, so, a phone. Did I say a phone? I mean a stone. You did whatever the rabbi did. That was how you became that person's disciple. That's how you were taught. That's how you learned. When Jesus called his disciples, he bypassed all the brightest of the bright. He went to those who had done very poorly on their SAT tests. In fact, some who never had gone even through elementary school. And he called them and said, follow me. A couple of fishermen who had been doing what their dad had done for years and years started following him. When Jesus said, drop your nets, they did it immediately and went with him. They weren't all such nice guys, you know. Matter of fact, a couple of them had really bad tempers. Jesus called them the sons of thunder. He had to kind of put a big check on them a few times and say, that's not the way we do things. By trying to blow somebody else up with anger. Later on, he called a fellow named Matthew, a tax collector, one of the hated and despised people in Israel. Follow me. And he did. You talk about a ragtag bunch of recruits. But Jesus believed in them even when they couldn't believe in themselves yet. Disciple. Three years, they walked with him. They lived with him. They did what he did. Healed people. All kinds of things. That they never believed they could do. They did. Little wonder that on that special day that we call Palm Sunday, one week before Jesus died on the cross. That when Jesus got on the donkey and started riding into Jerusalem, they took off their cloaks and they laid them on the ground as if, as if honoring royalty. Because he was their rabbi. 
He was the one they honored with their life. That was on Palm Sunday. And then came Gethsemane, when all the disciples, all of them, fled. And one of them named Peter denied Jesus three times. Imagine that. This Peter of all disciples that said, if everybody else leaves you, if everybody else stops following you, Master, I will never desert you. This Peter who had walked on water. The Bible doesn't say how long, but it does say he got up and walked on water. This man said with cursing, I don't know him. Then came Easter. The risen Lord Jesus showed himself to his disciples. He even showed Thomas specifically, look at my hands, look at my feet, look at the hole in my side. I am Jesus. What about Peter? See, Peter knew full well that no disciple who failed to follow his rabbi had the right to continue on as a disciple. You lost that right when you didn't follow the rabbi. If you don't want to stay under my yoke, you're out. That's why it was so, so important to learn how to be a disciple and follow him. And I think that's probably what was going through Peter's head when we read at the beginning of chapter 21 that he said to the other fellows, you know what? I'm going fishing. I'm going to go back, back to Galilee. Get one of my dad's fishing boats and go fishing again. That's what I was trained for. I'm not one of these disciples anymore. I know my place. I'm going fishing. And a number of the others said, we'll go with you. But you notice what the Bible says there. They caught nothing. Here's that question I asked you earlier. Why not? Because they weren't fishermen anymore. Jesus had called them to be his disciples, to be called fishers of men. The next thing you know, Jesus was showing up, teaching them again how to fish. In fact, they caught so many fish, you could hardly get ashore with a boat. 153. I don't know exactly why that number is mentioned there. Good question for us to talk about another time, but I want to hasten on here. Jesus not only taught them how to fish again, but he also had fish nicely fried out. And he said to the disciples, come and sit down. Let's have breakfast together. They did. And after breakfast, Jesus said to uh, Peter, come over here a little while and talk to you. Simon, notice that name, that was his old name. Jesus had later given him the name Peter. He said, you want to go back to being with your dad's fishing fleet? Okay, then you're Simon. Simon, Son of John, do you love me? What's Jesus doing? He's calling Peter to repentance and renewal. He's giving Peter a second chance. Simon, son of John, 
you love me? Three times. Three times Peter had denied his Lord. Now three times he says yes. It hurt him, especially that third time, because it went like a dagger, you know. He remembered clearly a third denial when the rooster crowed and he swore up and down, I don't know that man. Little wonder it pained him so that third time to have to say, yes, Lord, I love you. And Jesus said, then take care of my sheep. Love the ones I love. As you have seen me literally feed hundred hungry people, you go now and you feed them. You feed them the riches of God's word. So they aren't hungry anymore. What immeasurable grace of our Lord as he offers Peter a second chance. And the wonder it is, sisters and brothers, adults and children, he does the same for you and for me today. Whether you've been a believer for 25 years or whether you are not today a believer, God offers you and me. By his grace, he reaches out to us, he reaches to our past, and he invites us to allow him to break up our sinful ways, our hard-heartedness, the many times we've covered up, our weakness, so many times we've said, yes, Lord, I, I, I want to follow you. I won't do that again. The next day we did it again. Or maybe you have not ever said yes to Jesus as your Lord and Savior. And God is offering you a second chance today to become his disciple. To follow him with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. Oh, that grace of God. His unmerited favor in Jesus Christ. That's the grace of the second chance. Allow me a moment to tell you a true story. Billy Moore grew up in Ohio. A broken home, a broken marriage, drugs, the whole nine yards. He had long ago turned his back away from the teaching of his mother about Jesus. Billy was getting desperate, and one day he heard about an elderly man who lived not too far away who kept a lot of money in his house. So he figured he'd go and pay that man a visit. He broke into the front door. What he didn't know was that that man had a shotgun in his bedroom, and he came out of his bedroom with a shotgun. He fired a shot. But the buckshot missed Billy. Billy fired back twice. And the man died. He ransacked the house and he found $5,600. But it didn't take long before the police found him. And he was sentenced to die for murder. Game over. End of the story. Billy Moore's mother was a Christian. And she called up 
friends of hers who she knew were Christians who lived near to the prison where Billy Moore was being detained. They said, will you please visit him? And he said, yes, we will. They went to Billy and they said, Billy, Jesus is giving you a fresh start. He is willing to forgive you and give you a chance at life. Billy said, you got to be kidding. I murdered an old man in cold blood. I know my life is over. and I'm going to die in this prison. There is no beginning here for me. But that couple continued to visit Billy Moore in prison regularly and to share with him the gospel of Jesus Christ. And one day, Billy, as hopeless and broken as a person could ever be, repented. He got on his knees in that jail cell and he said, God, I'm so sorry for all the wrong I have done, including murdering that old man. I don't have much time left, but if you could make my life still count for something, it would be the icing on the cake. Billy Moore was baptized in a bathtub in prison. He went to court, he pleaded guilty. The case dragged on for 16 years. But Billy was a changed man. He became, as they said, a model prisoner. They called him the peacemaker because he sought to not only reconcile people to God, but to reconcile them to one another, even in that dark prison. He began Bible studies with inmates, and one by one he led men who were waiting there on death row with him the Lord Jesus Christ, to a new life in Jesus. My dear friends, do you see that God is a God of the second chance? If Billy Moore could be forgiven by God of murdering a defenseless old man, and used to bring renewal in the lives of others, then what could possibly disqualify you from the grace of God? If God could use a man like Billy Moore, living in a cage on death row, think of what he could do through you in your family, at school, on the job, here in this church. Billy Moore was sentenced to die on August 22 of 1990. Hours before that time, the Georgia Parole and Pardon Board held an emergency meeting to discuss a model prisoner. You can look it up. It's reported on the front page of the New York Times. But for the first time in history, a confessed killer on death row was set free. Billy continued to worship God in a church. He later became the pastor of that church. And he spoke around the country and even around different places in the world. And his message was always the same. The message of God's redemption and God's forgiveness. The God of grace. The God of the second chance. God who has come to us. In Jesus Christ. And that, my friends, is the grace of Jesus. The grace that sets us free from our sins time and time again gives us a second chance to be his disciple. And when it really comes down to it, 
We all need a second chance. We all want to be changed, don't we? In ways that we really know we can never accomplish on our own. We all want a good reason for living. We all want to help people do the right thing. We all want to have a heart that really is concerned for everybody around us. We all want a God who saves souls and can take us to heaven. Brothers and sisters, Jesus does that. And much more. He's the God who gives us a second chance. Whenever you or I are tempted to look around and say, what about that guy? You know what he did? He lied. It cost me my job. It cost me my home. It cost me my marriage because he lied. What about him? Or what about her? He told all kinds of rumors at school. I don't have any friends anymore. What about? Jesus has just one word for us. You love me? You really love me? Then follow me. That's the grace. The grace of God in Jesus Christ. Believe on him and know his grace today. Let's pray. Merciful God, there is more grace in you than sin in us. Let us not take this grace for granted. But may we use this precious gift you have given us in Jesus Christ for your praise and glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand.